uh, lined up. So starting next Thursday, uh, we will cover landscape plants for the shade. Uh, we will have part two of the backyard poultry. We will have growing 10 outstanding herbs and then youth gardening getting started. Uh, the one thing I do want to note is that um, the program will be held in the evening. Uh, we're going to mix it up a little bit. So instead of 10 o'clock, we're going to be uh, having it at 6 p.m. So uh, uh, just to see how, how that goes over and if we're able to uh, attract some other people that maybe are at work and aren't able to uh, make it on time. So with that being said, um, let me go ahead and switch things back. And I am going to uh, turn this over to Brandy. So let me stop sharing my screen. Uh, again, if you could turn off your video, that would be great. Uh, save us on some bandwidth. Uh, make sure your mic is muted. And Brandy, you can share your screen and uh, it is all yours. Okay, um, just trying to get the screen up. All right, does that look good? Uh, yes, it does. You look good. All right, I'm just making sure I have everything up on my screen. Okay. Um, all right. Well, th uh, welcome and thank you for uh, joining me. I'm Brandi Keller. Uh, I'm the Master Gardener Program Coordinator, as Paul uh, uh, mentioned, in Harris County. Uh, the topic today is going to be attracting the right wildlife to your garden. And immediately, that's already subjective because what uh, may be the right wildlife for one person, uh, may not be the right wildlife for the next person. Uh, so it's a personal decision based on um, your interests and then also the property that you have. Uh, we are going to talk about the basic requirements of attracting wildlife, uh, different wildlife, um, and then the plant options will be peppered in and among there. All of these photos are mine, so if you have a question, feel free to ask. Uh, but I definitely am a wildlife observer, um, so uh, hopefully, hopefully that'll come across. Um, oh, and I will be doing another talk uh, a month from now, June 25th on youth gardening, uh, but I hope today's presentation uh, helps you with your new or existing interest in wildlife gardening. And... It doesn't, is it, is it not forwarding to the next slide? No. I'm not, I'm not seeing it, Brandy. I, I, I just see your, okay. there you go. There we go. Okay. All right. So we do have, um, there are many types of goals that we have for our own personal property, but in this case, we're just going to be talking about wildlife gardens. Uh, our overall goal would be to increase the habitat uh, support for wildlife. So pollinators, birds, insects, other animals. Uh, that might involve uh, adding native plants and sustainable pra um, gardening practices. But overall, uh, the whole goal is to increase the, the diversity of plants, insects, and animals. Because I did mention native plants, I wanna um, go that route just for a minute. Native plants have simply evolved in the area uh, and they have evolved to support that native wildlife. This does not mean that you cannot use non-natives. Um, actually a combination of both uh, really increases diversity. Ultimately you have to decide what is best uh, for your own yard and your own needs. So when it comes to size, there really is no limit. Uh, a garden can be any size. You can have a large yard, small yard, um, a patio with containers or planter boxes. Uh, even small planter boxes can attract birds and pollinators. Uh, we're gonna take a look at this deck and landscaping again later on after we've talked about everything uh, to see what kind of principles could be applied here or are applied here. So one of the first steps is laying out a plan. Um, in laying out a plan is considering 
uh, layering plants. So we're going to go through each of those layers, uh, starting with trees. So even one large tree can provide for many animals. Uh, and it's not just live oaks. Uh, there's, there's other large trees out there. Uh, they can provide shelter, protection, uh, even hunting perches. Uh, and in this case, uh, I went with a smaller tree. This is a vitex. Uh, some other understory trees might be red buds, Mexican plum. So underneath that understory, you're gonna have some shrubs. And shrubs are a really good place um, if you have more than a few, that animals can kind of live their secret life there. Uh, there's, you know, there's secret paths and um, they can feed under there. This is also a really good uh, place if you have some fallen twigs and branches, don't automatically throw those um, out to the curb to be taken in the trash. If you put those back behind the shrubs where you can't see them, uh, a lot of other organisms that we're gonna talk about coming up can utilize those. Uh, ground cover. So this can be in addition to lawn or as a lawn substitute. Uh, really, it's gonna be acting as a living mulch. Uh, the more lawn you have, the it's, it just supports less diversity. It's just how it is. Um, so we're not gonna go into the big topic of uh, eliminating lawns, but if you have less lawn, you are gonna have more wildlife. Uh, this also helps retain moisture, which again, increases wildlife, especially around Houston. And it encourages uh, populations of insects and snails and uh, those types of critters that birds can forage for year round. And then annuals and perennials. Uh, these guys tend to steal the show because they're longing, longer blooming than trees and shrubs. Uh, there are year round uh, options here. So that's one of the great things about Houston. We're never without color. Um, but with some of these, one of our compulsions is to clean up uh, immediately when that flower has faded. And that really does a disservice to wildlife. In this instance, the purple cone flower or echinacea, uh, those seed heads could be used for uh, many other creatures. Uh, one of them is the goldfinch. Uh, once it comes back from the north, all nice and bright gold, we get the drab <laughs> yellow and they really like those seed heads. So consider um, delaying deadheading. So wildlife requirements, there are uh, really four requirements. I uh, combined two into one. So shelter and a place to rear young. If you have enough shelter, uh, you're gonna have enough, um, you're gonna have enough places to rear young. So that can be plants, twigs, uh, dead trees, please consider not removing all dead trees if it isn't an obvious safety issue. Um, one dead tree can provide a home for hundreds of organisms. Uh, in some cases, they provide all three of these wild wildlife requirements, shelter, water, food. Um, in addition, uh, it could be nesting material, a place to rear young, and then eventually a home for those creatures. Uh, water is another big one for obvious reasons that can be uh, beyond a bird bath, uh, even a water bowl that is changed out um, or going to the extent of a pond. A lot of insects uh, need a life cycle that involves water. Uh, dragonfly nips is an example. Uh, obviously, frogs start out in the tadpole uh, stage. If you have fish, you're going to have a lot less diversity. So that's the one sacrifice you'll make if you um, do have fish, because they're going to feed on all those things. Uh, and we really can still have wild. I mean, obviously, we can still have wildlife without water. Um, it just is going to help for a more consistent presence. And then, of course, food that goes beyond uh, our plants, the you know nectar, seeds, fruits. Uh, it's also what those plants bring in, like insects and small animals. They end up being food for other creatures. And our four main categories. 
birds, insects, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And all of these categories really have a complex interdependency with one another. So when you take one out, uh, it is going to have a domino effect. But of course, when you add all four in, um, that's what adds uh, diversity. So birds. Um, I may have more bird photos than anything else. I don't know. Uh, I'll deny it uh, if so. Uh, but the categories of birds that we could have are year round, uh, wintering, um, native, non native, or migratory. Being so close to uh, the Gulf, we really have uh, so many more options when it comes to birds. And then you just want to think about the obvious needs, uh, the shelter from predators, or there are birds that are predators. So they need shelter and hidden in order to prey uh, for a meal, uh, weather, nesting, and then of course, all the obvious um, nectar berries, nuts, seeds, insects. And again, that can include other birds or other animals. And then water for bathing and drinking. Um, it is really important to change your water out. It isn't gonna help to have a bird bath that sits there for weeks. Uh, of course, that can encourage mosquitoes, um, but you also wanna provide that fresh oxygenated water for your uh, animals. If you do leave water sitting in a bird bath for too long, be sure you take a sponge and wipe the inside because that mosquito larvae can actually attach to the inside of containers. So you just wanna be sure that's all cleaned out. And um, well, the chickadee up in the upper left, uh, that's the first example. Uh, you can't tell what it is because he is going to town in a bird bath. Uh, that was a bird bath right outside of my office at Bear Creek. Uh, that bed was about four, I don't know, it might be three, <laughs> it's been so long, three or four feet uh, wide. So there wasn't uh, much of a bed, but just that bird bath brought birds, not only that chickadee, but that's why the fla uh, fly catcher underneath, that was also right outside uh, the office window. So the chickadee is taking a bath. They are small songbirds. Uh, they like woodlands, they eat insects, seeds, um, and then also they can come to bird feeders. So they're popular bird feeder uh, birds. Uh, downy woodpecker, that's the same. They can be found in a wide variety of areas, uh, woodlands, neighborhoods, uh, bird feeders, and um, the downy woodpecker is really cool because it is the smallest uh, North American woodpecker. There's one that's very similar to it, the hairy, uh, but it's just slightly bigger. Now, when you're looking at the downy, the chickadee and the flycatcher, all of those are um, cavity nesters. So we're going back to that dead tree or um, not cutting down every tree um, that has died. And then also it's spring right now. So if you do have to cut a tree down, um, consider doing it in another part of the year uh, because there could be an active nest in that tree. So I'm not saving the best for last, but I might be. So the bottom right is the cedar waxwing and you can be the most um, experienced birder. And when you see a waxwing, you get excited. Uh, they are very sharp looking birds. Uh, you can tell with the uh, little mask over the eye, what you don't see is an extremely bright red um, tip on its wing. Again, that's where it gets wax wing. It kind of looks like it was dipped in bright red wax. And then if you follow the tail behind that leaf, you see a really bright uh, yellow tip of the tail. And those are only here in the winter and spring, but it's sitting on a low quat. Uh, they come in in flocks. So there are about 20 to 30 of them just attacking this tree. They love mulberries and uh, yopon hollies. So um, the plants that we have can really bring in some pretty cool uh, creatures. These are just some okay, okay. Uh, Brandy, yes. Brandy, yes. I've got a question for you. Yes. Um, do, you do you have a bird seed recommendation or type of seeds uh, to look for in the mix? Um, I go for a high quality bird seed. So if you're if you're looking for something like the goldfinches in the winter, that's a cool seed because it's a dead seed. Then um, 
the Niger. So that's dead. It won't uh, come up underneath. But all the other birds really like uh, like the um, striped sunflower or black uh, sunflower. I don't buy uh, bird seeds that have a ton of millet. I will buy millet separately sometimes for other birds. Uh, but you you don't win by buying a cheap um, bird seed from any store. So really uh, you want more sunflowers than anything. Good? Okay. Uh, okay, so here's some examples of uh, shrubs that birds like. I'm just gonna highlight the button bush. I'm partial to it. Uh, it's one of my favorites. So it's a woody shrub that likes to be near water. Uh, it is, uh, it tends to grow along riparian zones. Uh, so naturally it's water lo loving. We had one at Bear Creek. We didn't have water there. It was by a drainage uh, ditch though. So when it rained, uh, I think it got its feet wet quite a bit. But each of those flowering balls uh, consists of tons of little um, real long flowers and that pistil is coming up and extending past that flower. Um, they have found that a lot of insects will actually go through and pollinate each of those flowers twice. Um, just a cool fact. Um, so if, oh, can you be sure that you're, we want to be sure everyone's microphone is on silent. All right, I'm just, okay. So be sure all your microphones are on silent. Thank you. All right, I think I can continue. So um, if each of those uh, flowers are pollinated, it'll turn into a seed and then that ball ends up dropping into the water. Hold on. Paul, can you double check? Kathy, uh, I just got a notification. I am, hold on. Many other calls go. Do not see up here this again. And again, if you're my, there, oh, you got it? You okay. should be good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, no problem. Okay. So when that uh, ball falls into the water, it floats off in uh, a ton of different water fowl actually like those seeds. Um, the actual plant, uh, there are mammals that like to eat the twigs. Uh, the, the most common pollinators are butterflies, bees, and hummingbirds. And if that isn't enough, but wait, there's more, um, warblers and songbirds like to nest in it. So it really is a high quality uh, wildlife shrub. and the ruby-throated um, hummingbirds. So we do have a lot of different hummingbirds around this area. Uh, they are here for the spring, summer, and fall. Most of them do migrate south, uh, but there are some that migrate to here. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get any of those. Um, so the ruby-throated, they migrate down to Central America, um, Southern Mexico. And so in the spring, I get this female. She comes to the tropical sage. This is a native, uh, but it seeds like crazy. Um, I live with it. <laughs> I'll deadhead it and I'll pull up all the babies because it's worth it to me because this hummingbird always visits it. Uh, if anything, uh, once, you know, like right about now passes, I will cut it down um, and then it'll grow fresh for the fall. Uh, but that is one um, worth having. So she comes in the spring and then there's another one that comes in the fall and you see this one is on the Pride of Barbados. And she spends a lot of time uh, feeding or um, just resting. They rest a lot in the fall, uh, saving up their energy. If you think about how much they weigh, they weigh about um, equivalent to one penny. And then she takes off and flies over the entire Gulf of Mexico or sometimes down the coast. So they really are incredible uh, migrators. 
Uh, one last note on, and here she is sitting on the seed pods of the um, Pride of Barbados. One last note with uh, feeding hummingbirds. It's really important not to feed them the red dye. And then um, the homemade mixture is so easy. One part sugar um, dissolved in three parts water. But you cannot leave that sitting in your hummingbird feeder for days and weeks. It really needs to be uh, switched out every day. Uh, if, if you really don't want to do it every day, you might go every two days, but it can actually harm um, the, the, the um, hummingbirds that you're trying to care for. So be sure you change that out. So there are a few photos in this presentation that really, to me, speak to why we want to garden for wildlife. And this is definitely one of them. This is an Eastern screech owl, but it is a juvenile. They need trees, uh, woodland, orchards, uh, yards with lots of uh, trees. Again, they are cavity nesters. So another reason to keep uh, dead trees. So you can imagine my surprise when there wasn't one, but there were two. Now, I never saw the, um, the parent, uh, but I can guarantee you that she saw me this entire time. Um, I watched a great horned owl, uh, two of their uh, fledglings before, never saw the parent. So they stay well disguised, but they were hopping around uh, just investigating. Um, just a moment where, again, you, you appreciate uh, why you would want wildlife in your garden. This is at a friend's house, um, but they eat all kinds of animals um, or all kinds of small things, small um, frogs, lizards, even rodents, and sometimes other birds. So this is the backyard in which uh, these owls were in. And just take a second to see if you can spot where one of these owls were. Uh, this backyard, this particular backyard has a couple of very large established trees and then a, um, a lot of understory. That was very purposeful. She created this environment. This is not far from Buffalo Bayou Park. Uh, it is not the largest yard. So she really put a lot of thought and effort into it. And you can tell how special it is also because uh, the tree that that owl is sitting on is a Japanese maple, which typically does not do well. And she has, um, forget how many, but I know she has more than six or seven, it might be close to a dozen now, which is incredible. And of course, uh, before we switch to the next slide, uh, the one distinguishing factor, the main one for owls are those eyes. Uh, they cannot move their eyeballs, uh, so that's why they move their head all the way around. So this guy can move 270 degrees. Brandy, got a quick yes. question for you. Yes. Um, have you used feeder fresh in your hummingbird feeder? No, um, I, uh, I have not fed hummingbirds recently, but I'm kind of a purist just with the sugar and water. So I think when you find something that works for you, you just stick with it. But no, I can look into that though. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Our next category. Uh, the big thing here is to have a diversity in flowers. Uh, you don't want just one type of flower. Uh, a lot of these pollinators hop from, um, from plant to plant. And then also be very selective on the chemicals that you use. Avoid broad spectrum insecticides. If a pest that you have cannot be handled either by uh, spraying with a hard um, like a, a hard uh, a stream of water from a hose or uh, hand picking into soapy water, then uh, just try to find the chemical that will affect the least amount of insects and directed specifically for what you're, you're trying to um, get rid of. So their um, pollinators are generalists and specialists. Uh, some of them go around from flower to flower. Some of them need one variety. Uh, an example of that is uh, the monarch. I think it's pretty well known that monarchs, uh, they lay their eggs on milkweed. Um, but I do want to highlight something. The, the left hun uh, honeybee 
those live in colonies. I think when we think of bees, that's what we think of. But there are many species of native bees, and a bumblebee is one example. Uh, but a lot of these other native bees actually live in the ground. So if you are constantly heavily mulching, which is also good for your plants, it retains moisture, helps your weeds um, stay down, uh, but you are preventing native bees from uh, finding proper nesting areas. So if you have um, spots where you can leave some bare ground, that would help the native bee population. Uh, if I could, I'd talk about all the insects, but I can't, so I'm going to try to go through these quickly. Wasps, um, there's, uh, there are a few that are my nemesis, um, but other ones are just qu so cool and beautiful, and they are very important pollinators. And then dragonflies and other beneficials. Uh, I think most consider dragonfly beneficial, but really they're very opportunistic, so they can feed on beneficial insects also. But what's my trick for getting a, a dragonfly to our yard? Uh, we're about half a mile from water. This rebar, I mean, I think they just have a superiority complex or something. Uh, they like to sit on top of the rebar. We took that out. They found another high spot. Um, so, But it doesn't hurt to have a lot of pollinators. So that's probably um, their snack. And some more insects. Uh, the lace wing in the center, uh, that's the adult and the eggs. The eggs are on that really thin filament um, at the very tip. I found those on the side of my garage and, you know, on this leaf so you can find them um, in different areas, but that is a beneficial. Spiders, okay, <laughs> they're not technically insects and spiders are not my favorite, but this green lynx is pretty cool. It does not create a web. It lays in weight on uh, leaves and uh, flowers and then just attacks. So even though it's kind of considered a beneficial, uh, just by it eating beneficials kind of questions that. Uh, butterflies, moths. Um, sometimes I think we take moths for granted just because we don't see them as often. But sometimes the flowers that are not pollinated during the day actually get pollinated at night. Uh, the big adaptation here for butterflies is with a bird bath. Uh, sometimes that water can be too deep. So you'd want to add stones or add like flat stones, something, you know, so butterflies can perch or they can warm. And then be aware that there's butterfly gardens and caterpillar gardens. And uh, the next slide will show a different, um, the difference between the two. The African blue basil is a very popular uh, pollinator with our master gardeners. Uh, this does not grow like a small basil. It is a small shrub. Um, it's about three feet tall, but it, boy, does it pull in the um, pollinators. And then the rattlesnake master, that's not a typical plant that you would find in a lot of nurseries. It's um, kind of suited for the prairie, uh, but it's becoming more popular. It looks more like a thistle, but it's part of the carrot family. And again, it's just a really great pollinator plant for butterflies, bees, uh, wasps. All right, so going into the specialist, uh, one specialist is the Gulf fritillary butterfly. Uh, this caterpillar uh, just looks seriously menacing, uh, bright orange with those black thorns. Um, it's all a show. They really don't hurt you. Um, but their host plant is the passion flower vine. So the, cat or the, so the butterflies will lay their eggs on the passion flower vine. And then those caterpillars will feed on every part of that plant, a lot of times defoliating them. But the butterfly will get its nectar from other flowers um, other than passion flower, like lantana, zinnia. And the next slide is going to show you the sacrifice sometimes we make for uh, catering to wildlife. So this is the passion flower vine um, at Genoa Friendship Gardens, our master gardener satellite garden, and we don't mind this. Uh, 
we want them to eat because we want the caterpillars because the caterpillars turn into the butterflies. Uh, so just be aware of what you're getting into and what you'd like to sacrifice when uh, you are attracting certain wildlife. All right, any questions? Uh, uh, yes, yes, hold on, hold on. I've got, got um, um, I don't know if you're gonna to touch on lizards, on but the one yes. question is too many lizards in the garden, are they okay? Do they help in any way? Uh, I will uh, postpone answering that because we will talk about them. All right, and let me give you two more quick ones here. Okay. Does diatomaceous earth affect bees and other good bugs? Oh, goodness. Um, I don't. I don't remember that answer. Paul, do you know that answer? I know that it, it can, I don't think it's just gonna affect your um, pests. It could affect um, your beneficials right. so, too, so, but it has to come in contact with it. Exactly, so they have to crawl across it and it affects their, uh, the underside of that insect. Um, so if, you know, I would think for flying insects, unless it, it an area or that flower is covered in diatomaceous earth, it's probably not going to affect a bee. Um, can it affect other bug, good bugs? Absolutely, because it's, it's just there. So some of the beneficials will walk across it and it could affect them also. So I, I, got, I got one more for you then. Okay. Uh, do mosquito dunks harm rain barrel water? Uh, I don't know if I have the answer um, to that with rain barrels. Well, if if you have a screen uh, before the water goes in, there should not be any mosquitoes in it, mm -hmm. uh, it to to lay the eggs. So the it may be that you need a screen uh, to keep the mosquitoes out so they can't lay any of their eggs. Sounds okay. like we, sounds like we need a rain barrel. Uh, there you go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, uh, next on the list is mammals. Uh, so a lot of mammals, uh, they really border on being welcome and unwelcome guests. Uh, so why would we want them? Uh, will they help with insect control? And their presence really does help balance out that diversity. And the big reason for me is that they're really fun to watch but you do want to be proactive in discouraging nuisance behavior. We'll touch on that uh, in just a little bit. And um, I have compromise on feeding areas. So that means uh, if you do feel like you're, you know, you're, you want to encourage some of these animals, but you don't want them too close to the house, uh, you can offer something a little further away. That's what I did with squirrels. Um, but that's really, um, it's really an experimental phase. So you, you have to see if, if both of you can come to a compromise. Um, but starting with bats, uh, they are extremely critical for insect control. In this area, we have 11 species and all of them only eat insects. Can, and just think about that for a second. Um, how many more insects we would have if we did not have um, all the bats in our area? Uh, the top picture is the Mexican free tail bat. That is not a backyard, but in um, but it is somebody's backyard because there's apartments across the street. <laughs> uh, but uh, that is at Wall Street Bridge, and they roost together. This is a maternal colony, so they're females that are uh, giving birth. So uh, these ladies really like to feed on super high calorie uh, insects like. Um, moss and beetles, and they, they can fly up to 50 miles one night in one night, so 100 miles uh, both ways. The, the bat in the bottom picture is an eastern red bat. This was actually a photo that was submitted to me um, through extension. Uh, she wasn't really sure why there was one bat just hiding out in her grapefruit tree. And uh, the reason was because it was a cooler night. Uh, it was probably about in the 50s that day. And uh, a lot of bats, oh, 
I'll, I'll say, I should say a lot of bats in this area don't go into hibernation because it doesn't get that cold, but they will go into a hibernation like state when it um, gets below 55 degrees. So this eastern red bat was just uh, all tucked up trying to stay warm. The next day he probably moved on, uh, but they do not roost um, together with other bats. They roost solitary in trees, hollows, foliage, and they eat moths, beetles, assassin bugs, spittle bugs, so um, some pests there, so they're really great to have around. All right, so raccoon, I'm not going to encourage anybody to, <laughs> I'm not going to encourage anyone to bring raccoons closer. Uh, raccoons can be extremely uh, disruptive to our ecological system, um, but it does show what providing fresh water can do. Um, as long as you're not feeding them and providing, uh, uh, giving them, uh, allowing them to be more dependent on uh, our food. But this raccoon uh, came for fresh water and uh, evidently just to wash his hands. <laughs> The opossums uh, to the right is at the same water bowl and opossums sometimes um, they get blamed for what raccoons do. A lot of times uh, the raccoons have already caused the damage and the opossums come in you know to a trash can that's already tipped over. They move slower, um, you know they just everything about them they think a little slower so you might catch them when you didn't catch the raccoon. But opossums are super cool because they are, are only marsupial in North America. So basically they, they give birth to young that is almost embryotic. They crawl into their pouch and then they live there um, until they're grown. Uh, a lot of times people think that there's a high um, chance of rabies for opossums. Actually, it's the opposite is true. Uh, they have lower body temperatures than other mammals, so their incidence of rabies is actually lower. That hissing is just, um, and they, they will drool too, so that's the other thing that people may confuse. But that's a defensive me mechanism. But they are really good for a, um, a wildlife garden. Uh, they can be opportunistic, because so they can feed on uh, beneficials too, but they eat rodents, insects, slugs, snakes, fruits. Uh, so they're not, uh, they're not as bad as uh, their reputation. Okay, so the next slide is another one that, again, just bringing wildlife to your garden, uh, you're, not, you're not gaining anything other than uh, just this deep appreciation for being able to witness something. And, you know, we can... Uh, we can eat healthy and make our bodies nutritious, but it's not going to do any good if we, if our well-being is not there. And this is what wildlife provides. It provides us, if we're interested in it, this outlet that can reduce stress and um, just really make us feel good. And I mean, how often can you see an albino squirrel? This uh, little guy came around for about two weeks. Um, I was really surprised at how, you know, that it, he, he was an adult because we had uh, hawks that I've seen fly off with squirrels before, and he just looks like a really, really easy mark. But this is a true albino, uh, albino because his eyes are blue. Um, but there's no way to attract this guy. It's just the variations of nature um, that you can experience when you do have wildlife come close to your home. All right, so reptiles and amphibians. So they live very differently, but they actually use a lot of the same areas. Both are cold-blooded, so they have to be proactive in regulating their body temperature, which is why you'll see those anoles out uh, sunning themselves, especially on a cooler day. Uh, so we'll start with the anoles. Uh, the Cuban brown anole at the bottom is always brown, and it is invasive came from Cuba and uh, the Bahamas. Uh, they seem to do a little bit better um, 
in rocky situations, or you can see it's in front of Heather right here, in front of ornamentals. They always seem to be on the ground, and as you're walking by, they you know run across the sidewalk. I don't know why they're always on the other side of the sidewalk, that they have to run across. Why aren't they on the other side? Um, <laughs> but uh, so here's the deal is that since they are invasive, they can outcompete the Carolina anole. The Carolina anole is the top picture. Uh, they can be green or brown, so they change colors. They tend to be more green in warmer weathers, um, warmer weather than cooler temperatures. Uh, this particular guy, the uh, tip of the tail is really dark, so he probably lost his uh, with a fight with a bird, and now it's uh, regrowing. Uh, the Cara Alina anoles, they are our native uh, anoles. And so both of them are, to answer the question that came earlier, both of them are beneficial, and it's because they feed on pests. Um, slugs, caterpillars, uh, grubs, uh, probably really anything that they can, um, you know, that comes across them. So they are both, uh, they are both beneficial. At this point, we can't really do much to um, get rid of the brown anoles. So we have to kind of come to a compromise. And that is, since brown anoles live on the ground, uh, Carolina anoles, when outcompeted, they'll move up. So how we can provide to them is to provide dense enough vegetation where they can move up. And um, I forgot what else I was going to say about them. So adding, oh, adding height to the garden will help those Carolina anoles. Uh, but both of them are still beneficial. The, uh, and then controlling, I, again, I don't think there's any way you can really control them without affecting, you know, that whole food cycle. Uh, again, because they are beneficial, uh, I'm not sure, you know, you'd want to take any steps uh, to control those because you don't know if you would be hurting uh, the Carolina or other amphibians and reptiles. Uh, the other little guy here is a green tree frog. I think he thought he was being a lot better at camouflage than he was. <laughs> it wasn't doing too good of a job. But toads, frogs, salamanders, they all absorb water through their skin. Uh, so that's why you'll see them sitting in water. Uh, so that's the biggest thing that you can add to your garden is water at ground level. So you might have the bird bath for birds, but if you insert a water dish into the ground, those anoles uh, can uh, use it, and then also uh, different amphibians. This is also another good opportunity for a dead log to put in the back of your um, beds, maybe where you can't see it and you don't know it's there, uh, but the amphibians and these anoles, it would give the anoles somewhere to reproduce. And it uh, that breakdown of the log can uh, provide for both of these creatures. And one frog can uh, can consume up to 100 insects a night. So I think the lizards and amphibians are probably a group that um, kind of take a backseat to birds and insects, but they can really um, be more beneficial sometimes. And what do I, I'm just reading the slide here. So again, chemicals, uh, be careful with the chemicals if even if you're uh, addressing uh, a pest in the garden, some insect. Uh, again, it's going to affect that life cycle. It's going to directly affect uh, reptiles and amphibians. And this is just another gratuitous uh, photo of a, a green anole laying around. Uh, something when you see it, you're like, wildlife is so cool. I, and my stress immediately goes down. It's almost like uh, they're trying to teach us how to actually lie down. I, I wish I can lie as comfortably as this anole. Okay, don't scream. <laughs> so uh, snakes are not 
typically something you want to attract to your garden, but I think it's important to learn how to identify them and know which ones are venomous and which ones are not. Uh, this is not venomous, even though sometimes these can take on a look of a venomous snake, flattening its head. Um, but they eat mice and rats, all these things, you know, that we don't need. They're also a food source for birds of prey like owls and hawks. Um, so they, they are part of uh, that diversity. Uh, the five-line skink, you can tell, has moister skin than the anoles. So they, uh, they like more wooded moist environments. They live like in little crooks of trees, um, under logs, things like that. Again, a beneficial because they eat insects and spiders and slugs. Uh, when I see a five-line skink or any kind of skink, I kind of get excited because you don't always see them. So I find, um, I find that's a win for the day. And then a snapping turtle. Okay, so you may want a red ear slider or something for your pond. It's not like you're going to try to attract a snapping turtle. But when you provide a natural environment for your yard, you have to account for visitors. And so this female snapping turtle uh, showed up in our yard, uh, actually came to our front door, and I'm not joking, knocked on the door. <laughs> Um, but she was really looking for somewhere to lay eggs. And uh, that may sound horrifying, but if just leave her be, she can lay her eggs. She'll cover them up. Just be sure nothing gets into them if you actually saw where she laid the eggs. And then the next season they'll hatch and they're not going to stick around. They're going to go straight for the closest body of water. So it's just allowing uh, nature to do, do its thing. So discouraging nuisance wildlife. I'm just going to touch on this. I feel like we need to do our part so that way we don't develop negative relationships with some of this wildlife. So be sure you uh, critter proof your house, attics, crawl spaces. Um, don't feed deer, raccoons, uh, possums if you can. Uh, again, that creates a dependency. And while it may not have, uh, you might not mind that your neighbors and other people would and then they may call someone because uh, you know a raccoon uh, is coming to their door and then prevent behavior like securing trash and lids and using predator guards we have a purple martin house so we haven't had problems with um, with snakes but uh, if, if there were a problem we would definitely want to install a predator guard And again, just touching on this, uh, does wildlife need to be rescued? Uh, this is the rescue, it seems like it's the rescuing uh, season right now. So yes, it needs to be rescued. If you find um, a bird or an animal bleeding, obviously injured, you can tell if a, if a wing is broken. Uh, maybe a pet has delivered the pet to you or um, an animal to you. Or if you know for a fact and you've seen that uh, the parents have died, then call a wildlife rehabilitator. Uh, if you just find uh, feathered or partially feathered uh, baby birds in the ground, a lot of time that's their learning process. Watch it. You should be able to see a parent come and feed it a couple times an hour. They will not be with it all the time. Be sure you bring cats in, uh, dogs in, uh, allow it its own time, uh, but you do not need to call a rehabilitator for that. Uh, if you can find the nest, you can try to put it back in, but if they're fully feathered, they're fledglings and they, they need to be on the ground to learn. Uh, if you find a featherless, so it's a totally bald baby bird, if you cannot find the nest that it um, fell out of, or you cannot reach it, then you will need to call a rehabilitator. So this is a, a true false question. You're just gonna have to answer to yourself. Uh, adult birds, uh, true or false, adult birds will abandon their babies if a human touches it. And I've heard both sides uh, for years, but the answer is, it is false. So 
the parent will not abandon it. With birds, their sense of smell is not very great. Uh, that would be different if it was a rec uh, or a, um, a rabbit. Uh, the parent could abandon that baby. So if you do find a nest of rabbits, um, a lot of times you can create like a little grid with uh, like string and cover it up and then you can watch to see if the parent has come back. The parent does not stay with them. Uh, they try to stay away so that way it keeps the predators away. Um, so that's, I didn't mean to talk about the rec or the rabbits, so I just uh, touched on that. <laughs> And okay, so this may look a little overwhelming at first, but this is really a lot of the qualities that we have just talked about. Uh, you don't have to use all of these to be able to attract wildlife. The top three are the necessities, provide shelter and a place to rear young, water and food. Uh, if you wanna plan for more success, layer plants, add diversity and, uh, and account for all the seasons. Again, it's really, easy here in Houston. And then things, other things to consider, reducing lawn area, fall cleanup. It doesn't mean you don't clean up in the fall at all. Um, you just kind of maybe delay it. And then add native plants. And then safety, reduce chemicals, keep cats indoors. Cats are the number one killers of songbirds. Uh, they can also kill your amphibians and uh, reptiles too. And then discourage nuisances and all that should add up or any parts of those can add up to wildlife diversity. And before we go, I'm gonna show you a couple examples um, just of how we could apply what we learned today. Uh, this was a photo that I just was really drawn to. I found it on one of the um, Facebook birding websites. Uh, or pages. I contacted the person, uh, Jennifer, asked her if I could use this. Um, she just has this one really huge um, tree. She started attracting birds and she wanted to know, she, she started getting the bug. How do I attract more birds and more um, um, and, um, more animals. So I just looked at the time and noticed how late it was. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go skip through real quickly. So this is, uh, this is going back to the yard and these are all the principles that we talked about. And uh, so you don't have to have a large yard. Uh, this is a deck with a small uh, landscaping around it. There are two really large trees that are out of sight, but all of these different qualities have been applied here. And I'm Brandy Keller. Uh, you can find us on Facebook, the um, AgriLife Extension Horticulture page, also the Harris County Master Gardeners, and then I also have an Instagram page, uh, Nature About Houston. All right. Thank you for your patience. I ran a little bit over, but uh, thank you so much. And I hope we see you next week for Paul's gardening in, in the shade. Paul, are there any questions? Yes, Brandy. Yes, Brandy I do Brandy, have a couple, have a couple that, that we can get through get... here. Um, what is the best product to get rid of snails? Uh, I mean, that goes back to... Um, to using pesticides, I personally try to stay away from them. I, I, I have snails, I don't try to get rid of them. Um, again, if you uh, do have more lizards and uh, birds to your yard, that would be a natural way. I don't have an answer for chemicals just because I try to stay away from it, but I could try to find an answer for you. Okay, uh, there's another question on diatomaceous earth. Will it harm the Gulf Coast toads? Uh, I would again. I would think it would. It might scratch up their underside if they crawl across it, if they move across it. But I don't think it would um, have a real negative effect. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm. I'm not real familiar with the Gulf Coast toad. Um, again, when you, when you're talking about uh, diatomaceous earth, earth, a lot of times that is addressing insects. And if you're, you know, if those insects are ingesting something, could it affect the toads? Uh, with diatomaceous earth, because of how it it works, uh, I I don't know. I would think that uh, once it's consumed by one 
uh, organism, the very nature of what kills it, uh, it wouldn't work for the next. Uh, okay. But I do not know that answer. All right. How? Uh, here's the next one. How to attract the Carolina anoles? So it's real funny with so. I didn't really find a real clear cut way of attracting just those. Again, they like denser vegetation. So that um, that stem that you saw that green anole laying on, that was a, a Salome philodendron or what someone would call a split leaf phil philodendron. I always find them on, on there. So it has a little bit more dense uh, foliage. Uh, it's it, it has these branches that it likes to lay on. I think it um, it creates an environment that it likes, but really you want to add more vegetation, more hiding places. And then again, because they reproduce uh, like with old vegetation or um, decaying logs, provide something like that. Um, now, if you don't have any and you have the brown anoles, you may have a harder time. I, I don't I don't feel real positive that you would, you would be able to get them into your yard. Okay. Um, what animals will prey on the anoles? Uh, birds. <laughs> mm -hmm. So birds, snakes, uh, you know, uh, some, some, some insects could, um, but really it's going to be birds, other anoles too. Other anoles, uh, there's a little bit of, uh, um, there's a little bit of that. So really it's going to be birds and other small animals. If you have the opossums come in, uh, snakes, larger, uh, larger reptiles. And if you have a small anole, it could also be like if you have toads or frogs, uh, you know, and, and they're a little bit smaller, they could prey on them too. Okay. Um, that might be it. Someone did have their hand up, but I don't know if they're still on. They may not have been able to stay on. I'm not seeing that. Um, there's a there was a question about just uh, mosquito control, and if if you went to an AgriLife website, um, I believe we've got some documents there, or you could always send us an email, and we can get you in touch with those documents. So. Um, I think that is it. Brandy, thank you very much for your presentation today. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, don't forget, next week we'll be back, but we'll be back at a different time, uh, 6 p.m. So uh, everybody have a great week. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.